our audience, they, they desire to, to connect with, with the music, you know, connecting with um, something that's relevant. And it's something that's different here is that, is that uh, the youth and young adults, they want to stand for something. So um, chanting different songs that make bold statements about, you know, I'm a soldier for Christ or I'm going hard, those resonate. Those, those go deep down and move them to a place of worship. It moves into a place of man. I, I am somebody. I, I be, I belong to the God of the universe. And so we strategically select songs that yeah, will get them off of their seats and say, man, maybe, maybe I can stand for God. Maybe I can be about uh, our God's business. And we just use the music as a vehicle to do it. After doing seven years in prison, uh, I learned a few things while being in there. One of them was accountability has to be there. I've learned my personal experience that isolation uh, as a Christian is um, you're heading down a uh, dark path. There's a multitude of men here that help me on a daily basis, um, from personal counsel to just living their lives. It's encouraging to know that I have like people around when I need them or when I don't want them. They always come around, it's like that's what brothers do. It's just not good for a man to be alone at all. I mean, God himself is a community. They're my brothers and my sisters. They become my real family that I lack. We have a program called Proposition 48, which is at Central High School. Central High School closed down their sports program, so one of our young men went in there Ask if we could use the uh, the gym and uh, the weight room, and he has as many as 45 uh, students after school, which are part of that program. There's a discipline there. There's an accountability. After that ends, there is a, a short Bible study, and that becomes uh, part of our outreach and evangelism in terms of the church. What's up? <laughs> Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Not a cliche at all, but daddy, you are my strength and my redeemer. Question name, amen. Howdy. <laughs> I will say that it is much more beautiful in this here county during the day. <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's no lights out nowhere. I'm just driving and just going in the woods and deers and lions and tigers. Oh my, I, everywhere. People are crazy. I'm convinced. Give me a hug, we family. Give me, give me some hugging. 2.30 a.m. I need some more coffee. Tell the people out there, hook up an IV or something, because I am, I am tired, but I am ready to preach the gospel. All right, I am so happy to be here. Man, my brother Tom and his wife, we were, we were here not too long ago, and it was just pretty sweet, just, to, just uh, the realness of, 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 of this man of God. And I, I just really appreciate that. I know I made that word up, realness. Just follow me. But I, sometimes when, you, when you're sitting with a person for so long, if you've been married for any length of time, I've been married for 18 years, and... Um, um, when you've been married for some length of time, the person that's sitting next to you, you forget how ridiculously, insanely dope they are. I use those words that way. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Don't underestimate what you have. Because you have a great, a great, a great pastor. And I, I just want I just want to tell you that. Um, don't, under, don't do it. I have a mission today, and unfortunately, your pastor gave me permission to be myself, so you're stuck with me. <laughs> I have no other way to, 
preach or teach um, other than to do without sugar. Um, we hugged and everything, so we're family. You know me, I know you. We hugged and everything, so we're good. So the doors are closed. This is family time. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor? No, seriously, say, neighbor? <laughs> family time. And when family starts to talk around the dinner table, we just get butt naked and just, not, not literally, <laughs> just some of you keep your clothes on. But we're going to, I'm never going to be invited back. That's sweet. But we are going to get real today, and I just want to talk about something. If I had a way of teaching that would describe the way that I, I, like, to, I like to deliver, and that would be like the, uh, I, was, I met a guy, uh, I was doing a research on uh, the military, and this dude just so happened to be in the Marines, he was a, he was a guy, he, he was an ex-Marine, and uh, I asked him, if you could give me one life lesson that you learned from the Marines, what would it be? He said, um, well, we push you as far as you can go, and then we push you some more. See, I'm hearing some great stuff about this ministry, but I'm here today to push you some more. Because the capacity of the paracletos, the Holy Spirit that's working inside of you, has so much potential. So much missional potential. I'll be a lame dude if I came up here and did some sprinkle some splendor. Got that. There you go, y'all ready. It's like 4 o'clock in the morning and you're not getting it. I'm going to talk about a guy who means a lot to me. Uh, his name is Saul. Typically, we refer to him as Paul, and he is Paul. However, I just so happen to resonate with Saul, and you'll get that in just a few minutes. Some of you Bible scholars are not going to like what I'm about to say. I don't see Paul as the one that wrote the epistles and, and the letters and, and this dude that wrote most of the New Testament and, and all this stuff. I, I see that, but then I see who he was. I see him like a gangbanger. I told you he wasn't going to like it. Oh, you see, he represented a crew uh, called the Jews. And then there was another crew called Christians, first being called Christians in Antioch. It's amazing. I just got back from Israel a couple weeks ago. And then walking through the old Jerusalem and, and walking through and feeling the tension. Oh. I can imagine, I can see Saul. Oh, y'all don't get it. Do you remember the first martyr, Stephen? This dude was not just a banger. No, no, he was more like an enforcer. He would drag mothers, fathers, sons, kids to be brought to justice simply before, because of what they believe. Bangers, they just, one person wears red and one person wears blue, and then they just automatically make them their enemy simply because of what they're representing. This is who I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Saul. And uh, this is a pretty sweet story. Y'all know the story. He, he was riding up the street, minding his own business, listening to his music. Now, this is, I'm running through the, my theological grid of Troy, okay? So y'all work with me. And so like, what's happening is he's riding down the street and minding his business. Y'all don't see him? He's in his car like, boom, boom. Where the little dude at? Where is he? Where is he? Give me some hugging. Give me some hugging. Long distance hug right now. Man, you're pretty sweet. Give that man a, a clap or something. I meant to warn you, I get kind of like bird syndrome. And I just go off there. I'm, I'm going to come back. I promise. Just go with me and we'll come back. I promise. Just stick, stick with me. This uh, Saul um, is, a, is, a, is a pretty sweet story. He's on his way to the road of Damascus, down to Damascus, going to Damascus. He got permission uh, from, the, from the higher ups to basically go and do his job and bring people to justice. Bring Christians to justice. Bring Christians to justice. And he's on his high horse, minding his own business with his homeboys. They're riding up the street. And then he literally gets knocked off his high horse. Hey, <laughs> y'all, I dare. And he gets knocked off his high horse, and then he's blinded, and he's taken over to Damascus, and he's going over there, they're playing weed, eating Doritos, and they're sitting and they're chilling, doing what they're doing, they're just, just hanging out, right? And then he's there, he's blinded, he can't see, they don't know how he's playing weed, and he's blinded, but he's doing it, they're sitting there, and they're hanging out, and he's sitting there, and there's this guy that enters into the scene. His name is mentioned a few times in scripture, but it's not the same one. We're talking about a guy by the name of Ananias. 
Every time I say the word Ananias, I want you to take your finger, or not literally, but to uh, kind of think of I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the regular Christian, the regular individual. No pedigrees, no degrees, no position, no leadership. The straight, normal Christian that comes to church that loves God. He comes to this point where he's sitting there. He knows the reputation of the Saul. And the God of the universe taps him on his shoulder. And he says to him, hey, yo. Troy's version. (laughs) I want you to go. And I want you to go talk to this dude, Saul of Tarsus. I want to pick up here in Acts chapter 9. I want to pick up with the response, this deep theological response. As I begin to exegete this, I couldn't help but see from the Strong's reference numbers, the words that in verse 13, the words response after the Lord comes to Ananias. He said, Ananias, I want you to go over and I want you to go to talk to this guy who has this reputation to the person that we typically walk on the opposite side of the street of. I want you to go over to him and I want you to tap him on the shoulder and tell him I want to use him. And there's this deep words you will find in your lexicon. Just, huh? He responds in verse 13. He said, Lord, I have heard many reports about this dude and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. His reputation comes before him. The dude with the 19 piercings. The girl that had several babies out of wedlock and we typically talk about them instead of helping them out. I feel like we need a hug real quick. Give me a hug. Oh, here we go. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm, no I'm so, maybe I should walk on the opposite side of the road and not even be bothered with them. Because they're just too hard to reach. I was talking to a Muslim one time from the nation of Islam. And he started using these words. Like you Christians, you know, this is one of the times I didn't want to be a Christian because like you Christians and put us in this category. Unfortunately, he was correct in his statement because he was saying you Christians. See, when we go to the mall and we're going to do our proselytizing, when we're going to, when we're going to share, we're going to, we're going to share what we believe. He says, you think about like a tree. And, and, and what we do is, is that we go and we, we climb up the tree and we go way up the tree and, and we go for the fruit and we, and we reach up there and we grab it, we pluck it down and we're getting scratched on the way down and they're getting bruised up and we're coming down, but we get down and we got it and we take them and typically in the nation of Islam, there's five individuals that come around you to ensure that you understand and how to make the Quran applicable to your life. And they come around and they come around them. He said, but what you Christians do is that you go for the low hanging fruits. You go for the ones that kind of sort of look like you, that talk like you, and look close to being Christian and be comfortable with it. You're not interested in reaching the hard to reach. See, we're good with the homeless. We're good with the single moms. We're good with the addicts. But what about the guys that carry them guns? What about the guys that's cutting themselves? Who's going after them? Whose boy are they going to sit on? Whose pastor are they going to be? Just give me a hug. <laughs> This is Saul. That's why I need to get us in the right context. Because we think of him as this holy, hallelujah. No, 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 no. Stephen was the first martyr we know of. This dude had a reputation. He was the hard to reach. He was that individual that you smirk at instead of going to talk to. Let's finish this. And it says that he came and he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. That would be me. But the Lord said to Ananias, he sent him two texts, a tweet, and, and, and then he sent him a Facebook message. Say, please, please, send him two daisies in the mail. Say, please, kind of, sort of, could you? Absolutely not. <laughs> Go. You see, going, uh, the Great Commission is not a great suggestion. It's 
It's not a great suggestion. You were created in the likeness of the image of God, bearing his Holy Spirit, para being next to Paracletos, his Holy Spirit, inside of us to sit on our thumbs, to reach for the low-hanging fruit? Absolutely not. He's given the power, the dunamis, to make stuff happen. And he's saying, I've called you. I want you to go. This is pretty sweet. This man, this is an oxymoron. When you exegete scripture, it's pretty sweet. I love the Bible. I preach to myself. Woo! <laughs> this man is my chosen instrument. That makes no sense. Practically, he does nothing, no benefit. But when you put on God's sexy lenses, you start to see beyond this stuff. God says that he's my chosen instrument, even while it's prevenient grace. When we're garbage, God loves us so much that he's reaching for us and he's waiting for us to respond to him. He's reaching, he's going after us. Ain't no different than you, than them. Dirt is dirt, stank is stank. <laughs> Who up in here was stanking at one time? Give me a, give me a stank offering. Oh man, this is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. Ah, man, I don't have time, but when you get a chance just to dissect this just a little bit, but let me just give you some practical application. I do gang prevention and intervention all over the country. And uh, when I walk into places, it's typically churches or, or law enforcement, which is weird, you'll understand in a minute, but law enforcement and some other stuff. And then I start to go into universities and all this stuff, and I'm talking to them. The major misunderstanding about gang members is that they don't have any structure. If you represent red, you never wear blue. If you represent red in the five-point star, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Those are core values of one of the gangs, by the way. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. You represent that, you typically never speak of, you never write down the number six. You can be in a gang for 30 years and never write down the number six. You'll skip right over, you'll leave it blank. You pass, because you represent the left side, you pass everything to, towards the left, you never pass it to the right. You have to learn what's called the 101 keys. These, if you're a businessman, standard operating procedures, SOPs, there's a book that's been around since the early 50s that dictates the, 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 the structure of organizations. So don't tell me that they don't have structure. No, the problem is that Christians are not available to give them the right structure. The gang members always, the doors are always open to the gang member's house. What about yours? Are you too consumed with your own family to be consumed about? If you would ask Jesus who's his family, what would he say? It's in the Bible somewhere, right? Verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He'll get it. And then there's Phenesis. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. He placed his hand. Imagine this. This dude is like known for just bringing people to justice. And people's heads are getting cracked everywhere. And people being dragged off to jail. And he's sneaking up. Oh, brother. Let's just give him, a, give him a man hug. You know what I'm saying? Like from the back. You know, like, bro, you better back up. Can you get the picture? This is a regular dude. And a nice. There's nothing spectacular. We would have to be isogeting to make something spectacular about this Ananias. He was just like you and me, so there's no excuses. Oh, I don't, I don't have anything in common with them. I don't even look like them. I don't talk like them. I don't, this dude has nothing in common with Saul. Nothing. Who says about you anyway? You ain't got enough power in your pinky and your whole body to do nothing. At our best, we're like a pile of dung. That's when we have to totally depend on the God of the universe and his ability. And when we open our mouths, it's his words that are coming out. You feel me? And then immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. And it says that he went and he started to teach in the synagogues. Now, I, I debated with some scholarly dudes about how long did Paul spend time in the desert. I don't care. 
it really doesn't matter. The, the, the thing here is, is that this person, because God seen that they had some worth, and he had some worth, he had some value, God seen that from the jump, from the beginning. So what does it take in order to be accepted in the family of God, even though you're ridiculously different? Even though you're the hard to reach, even though nobody else wants to be bothered with you. Is it three classes, two discipleship programs, 14 booklets? What was the Acts 2 church before there was an Acts 2? I don't, I don't know. No, no, no. Immediately, maybe if believers start to spend time, then maybe something could happen with those that are hard to reach. Let me, let me take just a few minutes. I just want to. You know the story, right? Paul goes off and he shares the gospel. He comes back and uh, Barnabas, they have to introduce him to the rest of the, the, rest of the crew. And then they basically accept him in. He started to share the gospel. It was ridiculous going to some of the places where Paul was. And it, it was just insane just to see the, 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 the power of what God can do with the, with the, with the, with the help of Ananias. Just, just fascinating. I was raised in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, you got two cities in, in Grand Rapids, that are the largest, uh, Detroit being the first one, Grand Rapids is the second. Um, you read some of the stats. Um, that, that, those stats are a little old. But there's 59 known gangs in my, in my neighborhood. Um, people die. All right? Um, I was raised right there on, on the strip where prostitutes, gang, bang, bang, gang bangers, and all this stuff, but gangs were different um, when I was growing up. But right around the 80s, something weird happened. Some, some guys out of Chicago decided that they wanted to move to Michigan. Instead of going to Detroit, they chose to come to Grand Rapids. And they brought these two gangs, one of them being the... Uh, and they came into the city, and uh, make a long story short, uh, at right around 13, 14, I decided I would leave my mama's house. And, um, and uh, the following summer, I did. Um, I had a son on the way. But when I left, I left to go with this family out of Chicago. I didn't know that the, uh, um, that the uncle was, a, was the leader of, of, the, of the organization. This family was an awesome family but they were rooted and they understood and they lived and breathed this organization. Uh, Pastor mentioned I wrote a book and uh, I was writing, this lady was a lot smarter than me, she was helping me and she asked this question, she said, it seemed like there's a gap. It seemed like you were a normal kid, but then over here, you start doing some crazy stuff. I said, Troy, what happened? She's a good reporter, so she asked open-ended questions. So I couldn't just answer with the one word, you know, like, no, yes. I said, uh, when I was nine, I got molested. Oh, see, typically men don't talk about Jack. That's why we messed up. I said I was molested, so I had a couple little issues. I wasn't your typical 10, 11 year old. My family, we fight. That's what we do. Uh, I'm talking about organized fighting. You know, my mother's a martial artist, which is extremely difficult and weird. Most of my brothers, black belts, MMA fighters, all this stuff. My little cousin, he's okay. You know what I'm saying? Uh, his name is Floyd Mayweather Jr. Um, we grew up fighting in, in boxing gym from, as babies. So you take that, put me in the hood, plus being molested. So now I'm wondering, am I homosexual? And I don't like bullies. Nobody was ever going to get picked on down to my watch, ever. And then I'm wondering, like, man, how do I prove that I'm not homosexual? Oh, I have sex with as many girls as I can. What does a nine-year-old have the business having that conversation? So I went on a spiral, and it messed me up. Because after a while, you start to like what you do. The dopamine being released to the mind. And uh, I got addicted to violence. And so what happened is um, I ended up getting involved with this uh, organization. 
you know, get my own crew. Basically went on to my, my mother's neighborhood, kicked her out of her house, and took over that block. And had about 60, 70 guys under my leadership when I was younger. Um, uh, got involved with, with, a, with a lot of garbage. Started selling dope. Got caught in a grand jury investigation, which means the police watch you for a long time. They lock you up. Most of the guys got like 15 years. My first offer was 20 years to life. I ended up doing two years by the grace of God alone. Fell to seventh grade three times, sent over to, uh, to alternative school, get kicked out of alternative school. When do you go after alternative school, right? Like, So you, can, can you see the tsunami of issues? Then three of my brothers were shot. One on my mother's porch, one across the street from my mother's house, one across the street from my grandfather's church. See, my biological father left. His dad, who I, it's weird for me to call my grandfather, was so separate from us. The only thing I can call him is Elder Morgan because he was a pastor of this church that was two minutes walking distance. Now listen to me, we literally shot anything that breathed right in front of the church. And the men of the church just sat there like some lames. They didn't even come out and say hi. Oh, they think, they'll say, pull up your pants, take off your hat. They'll say all these great things, but I had no words to say. Because we were the unreachable. So I was a little ticked off. And my brothers got shot, so I do what I do, retaliate. But it got too tight. If you can imagine two, three hundred people coming to kill you every single day, that was my life. I got scared. I don't know what these rappers talking about on these CDs, they lying. I got scared to death. I ran. Found myself in Georgia. Offered a job by this guy after a while, become a bodyguard. The stuff he asked me to do, I do it for free. Guess where I end up? Durham, North Carolina. Homeless, living in the back of a U-Haul truck. Lost my mind. You see, those things happened before I hit the age of 23. What's that do to a person? And meanwhile, while we're looking at them and we're pointing and we're looking, and all, and it all started because of depravity, obviously, but it all started because of, of being offended. But meanwhile, the church folks looking at me like I'm just an animal. Like I don't deserve anything or don't, don't even want to approach me like I'm just untouchable. And I'm begging, my body, my soul is yearning for someone just to just acknowledge that I'm present. I go off and meet this girl at this nightclub. She ended up taking me to church with, oh, we family, right? Let's do this. Come on, give me one, man. <laughs> My brother. Here it goes. I didn't believe in church. You see, the, the, I believe that white people were the devil. And I believe that the church was the white man's trick to continue to enslave black folks. That's what we're taught in our game. Every single day. Let me tell you how, see, you know how much poison it takes to kill a rat? About 2%. You, know, you put 98 good, 2% poison. So the, or 98% uh, accurate. See, the accurate part was, is because our leader here would say, you know, like when you go out to the suburbs and you go into the store and you're walking around and it's just like, somebody's always following you. You haven't done anything. Or, or, or you go to the restaurant and they're looking like you don't deserve to be there. They're looking at you like a caged animal. Or the magic sound that every black person knows when you walk past the door, ch -ch 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 -ch, the door's locked as if you're going to steal something. You're grabbing up the kids, clenching their purses. They hate you, so why don't you hate them? Go off into this church, and lo and behold, it's full of white people everywhere. <laughs> and I'm walking, and there's like hugs everywhere, you know? But you know about the 19th hug? Something started to happen. 
these people weren't who they were telling me that they were. Somebody lied to me somewhere. Either they are all good at pretending or somebody lied somewhere. And I believe God used that to break my guard down. And then sure enough, somebody came and delivered the word that I couldn't deny. And I accepted the call of a lifetime was to totally surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I told him, if you take this desire, you have your addictions, you do your porn thing, whatever you do, mine was, I like blood. Take this desire to hurt people away from me. Take this thing from going zero to 300 in a matter of seconds. Take that away from me. Take this desire of alcohol because it drives me crazy. And I surrendered. And that girl that went to to took me to church. She's my wife today. Uh-huh. That's right. I'm getting home in just a few hours from here. Let me tell you what God can do. And only God can do this. I like it. I don't have any of the others. I don't have any degrees. I don't have nothing. I'm, I'm an empty slate. I don't have anything to offer. So it's all glory to God. Right? This is what he does. He starts to send me some Ananiasis. That sounds weird, but he sent me some Ananiases. <laughs> and first thing he sent me is a pastor. And obviously I've become some, some way, some shape, or form. I guess I'm a pastor of some sort. So I've become a pastor, right? And then after that, he sent me this engineer, second grade reading level. I've become one of the 15,000 certified by Microsoft in the world. Because somebody sat with me and literally talked to me word for word. This is a topology. This is TCPIP. This is how many uh, IP addresses you can get in one subnet. It's hard to explain to me in a language that I can understand. It's hard to spend time with me. And he wasn't even a Christian. He was a Muslim, a part of Muslim mosque number one, but was willing to spend the time. Where was the Christians? Then I became a business owner. He sent me this business guy, multi-million dollar corporation. And basically, I was being subcontracted out to General Motors and a bunch of other places. And I worked for NBD Bank. That's scary. I got two felonies, people. <laughs> and he sent me this business guy and I opened an IT firm, uh, a staffing company, like a Kelly Services for IT people. And he was staffing out to um, have some 40-some people working for me uh, in different places around the metro Detroit area. But then I went back home. That 96,000, that's your number, but it was my number too. That 96,000 just haunted me. The reality is, is that when I left Grand Rapids, it was like 20 something gangs and come back to some 50 gangs and, and just the city turned upside down. Something inside of me that I think Bill Hybels, that holy discontent. If I truly have the Holy Spirit, if I'm truly a believer, and if I, if I, if I believe in the, in the boat rocker of Jesus Christ, if I believe that, then man, there's surely something that I can do about this. And we left it all. Six figures, people. Left. It hurt. And we went and we went to the street. And next in two years, I was selling chicken on the street corner. Broke. But God used it to get me acclimated with the people. Then I ended up getting a job. I worked for the American Red Cross. I ran the IT department. My wife is the public relations director. So back here we go. Six-figure world again. And I own a little marketing company. Back over all this money and stuff. Everything's happening. I'm bivocational pastor, running this church and planning this church and all this stuff happening. And then my nephew was murdered. Then it seemed like the church, and it all hit me, that the church did not have a viable solution. I felt that the church did not have a solution. And I quit the church, and I went over and sat under uh, a dude by the name of Wayne Schmidt in Kentwood Community Church in, in, Grand, in uh, Kentwood, Michigan. My mentor has been for the last seven years. Sweet dude, humble. But he hit me across his chest and said, Troy, you can't sit here forever. He says, if you can do it all over again, what would you do? And I told him, I said, we would plant a church that would cast like me could come in with no apologies. We can do what we've been doing for years overseas. It is contextualizing the gospel to a culture of the marginalized. 
the heart to reach. To do whatever, do anything but sin to reach them. Without one single apology. And they were crazy enough to get behind it, him and Mark Gorvett and a couple other crazy people got behind it and we planted what we know as the EDGE. The EDGE is an acronym which stands for Evangelism, Discipleship, Spiritual Growth, and Empowerment. We suck in a lot of things, but we are very serious about those things and not just for a t-shirt. Serious about evangelism, discipleship, spiritual growth, and empowerment. Most, every one of the guys you see on that, on that screen, they're leaders in our church. They start at 15 years old. See, we say it is, is that if you can, at 17 years old, 18 years old, if you can give them a gun and tell them to go fight for our country, then why can't they lead in the local church? Lead, not lit envelopes, not interning, lead. Because they're going to lead in a gang. 70 people under my leadership. I'm saying, where's Ananias? So my challenge to you, I challenge you to use this. It's twofold. I'm going to be really bold out here. We family, right? We good? Here's my challenge. First challenge. Is that you better find out who's that 96 in your context. Who's the heart to reach in your culture? Who's, it may not be the bangers. It may, it may not, most people that do what I do and that have been doing it for a while, they're either dead or in prison. So don't look for that one out of 100. I'm saying look for the heart to reach, whether it means the, the person that's cut. I don't know what it means here, but you need to figure it out and go after them. And it's very simple. Take what you have. Take the rod you have in your hand, your gift, your talent, your ability. That's all we do. And I'm talking about 500 lives that have come to Christ in the last five years. No smudging numbers. And all we do is just live and be among them. I want you to consider, it may be your, your nephew, your cousin, that you just avoid every time they call. It might be in that, that high school where you need to be. And they need to know about finances. This is my last one. I'm gonna be, I told you I'm going to be bold and honest. I have to raise 70% of our funding because we are a missions church. Those kids you see on the TV, they are a church. They ain't got no money. 70% by doing what I'm doing today, that's how we, that's how we eat. That's how, we, that's how we're able to do and do what God has called us to do. I want you to prayerfully consider if God is calling you to be a part of financially supporting what we do. We good? We still family? Give me a hug. Daddy, this is your church. We are your kids. We don't sit up here and act like, like we understand what to do. We don't know Jack. But what, we, what we're willing to do is to totally surrender to you. And say, Lord, take my mouth, take my hands, take my feet, and move me in the direction to reach the heart to reach. I know that this church is serious about that. Show us what to do, Daddy, in Christ's name.